He said, to the extent I desire to move through you, you must allow me to cut on you. The leader's cut. What's up, everybody? Hope you're doing well this week. All my party people, I want to welcome those of you who are just joining us for the first time to the Leaders Cut. Uh, it's fun to see each week a number of you uh, joining this conversation that you didn't know I existed a week ago and I didn't know you existed a week ago. So it's just fun to see God step into a conversation between the two of us. Let me just say, as we step into today's topic, uh, if you don't feel like being cut on today, you need to turn this off right now. I I'm, I'm doing you a favor as a friend. If you don't feel like a little bit of divine surgery, you turn this off. All right. Having said that, if you are in the mood to drop a little bit of dead weight, stay to the end. Trust me that this, this was fun to prepare for. <laughs> It ain't pretty, but it's going to be fun because what we're talking about, as you saw in the title on the thumbnail, we're talking about seasons of hiding. And here's what I know. There are enough of you in this conversation that not all of you are in a season where you're in the light. You're in the limelight. You're on the stage of your career. You're in the C-suite. You're in the boardroom. I know based on the math that probably... The majority of us are in a season of hiding. And so I want to walk you through some things that I, I pray are helpful um, as you steward the season God has you in in preparation for the season he's taking you into and towards. So let me pray and we'll jump right in. God, thank you so much for our time together. I thank you for every person you're leading to be a part of this conversation. Holy Spirit, would you right now in this moment, no matter where they are, no matter what they were doing before they press play, Holy Spirit, would you visit them? And would you speak so clearly and sweetly and strongly to them during our time together? Let this be a fruitful time for each of us and for your kingdom. God of the universe, Surgeon of heaven, would you now cut on us with divine precision? You know what we need and we don't. So we yield ourselves. Do whatever you want. We will lay on your operating table until this work is finished. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, I, I know for some of you, uh, in a hiding season, maybe a prolonged hiding season, uh, this, this is going to serve as an encouragement. But for others, this is going to serve as a little bit of conviction. Um, if, if you're in a season of striving, when God has asked for a season of hiding, you need to know this is going to be convicting. All right. And let me just say, nothing is more embarrassing than what happens when you're striving, when you're supposed to be hiding. All right. So just remember that as we step into this. All right. If you're striving right now, but God's asked you for a season of hiding, you need to get your bow hiney into the cave where no one can find you. There's something God wants to do. And in his love, mercy, and grace, it's the season of hiding where he protects us from being exposed as we learn what must be learned and as we prepare for what is coming, all right? So first, let me just tell you, do not look upon a season of hiding as though it were a four-letter profanity. Some of God's best work is not just done in the backside of the mountain. Some of God's best work is done in the deepest of caves. That was one of the things, uh, you know, part of what I'm sharing with you today has come from my last 10 years. And uh, I remember one day the Lord saying, Preston, uh, I'm taking you into a season of hiding. I didn't know how long it would last. Didn't know it would last a decade. And I felt like he said, I'm not taking you to the backside of the mountain because someone could find you there. I'm taking you into the deepest 
part of the cave. You're going to find stalactites, stalagmites, whatever they're called, that you've never even seen before, Preston, and no one is going to find you in this cave except me. Okay, how can a season be bad when God starts it off telling you, I don't want anybody to find you in this season because this season, you and I are going to put in some serious time relationally and preparationally. We're going to prepare. I'm going to prepare you. So as we go into this, don't you be cursing seasons of hiding. I don't care how long your season has lasted so far. God's doing something. And I'm going to show you some of the why behind it today. All right. First, to make sure we're on the same page, let's make sure we understand what a season of hiding is. And let me tell you, I'm going to give you a definition for a season of hiding. This is gangster, but it's not just gangster. This definition of a season of hiding, you're going to want to shoot me. I'm, I'm telling you, this is one of the most expensive definitions I feel the Lord has ever given me for any word or phrase. And you're not ready for this because I wasn't ready for it. Here it is. A season of hiding is a miraculously powerful, masterfully personal, meticulously painful season with the all-powerful one in private. Look at those. Miraculously powerful, masterfully personal, meticulously painful. I looked up this word meticulously because when I felt the Lord say meticulously painful, it hit me some kind of way. And then it hit me harder when I looked up the definition for the word meticulously. Check this. The definition of meticulously is this. In a way that shows extreme care about minute details, in a precise and thorough way, sometimes to an excessive degree. Are you joking me? This is what he says this season of hiding is for. It's, it's meant to be meticulously painful, Preston. Sounds a lot like surgery, right? I'm telling you, this is going to be filthy. We're going to go through 1 Kings 17, part of Elijah's story, the beginning of Elijah's story recorded in Scripture. But I want to remind you as we step into this, the biggest public moments on God's behalf are usually preceded by the longest seasons of hiding off everybody's radar. 1 Kings chapter 17, starting in verse 1, this is the beginning of what is recorded in scripture about Elijah and his life. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab. Okay, so clearly guy's been born. He's been alive for some time because he already has an audience with the king. And this is the first verse we hear of his life. Elijah says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, Thou, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Okay, homie comes on the scene, but he didn't come out of nowhere. Never, ever forget, just because God makes someone instantaneously famous, it does not mean they came out of nowhere. And trust and believe, if God is the one causing them to become more known, more influential, trust and believe it's because they have been privately doing all God asked them to do in preparation for what you will now see them do. So he comes on, it ain't raining unless I say, that's Preston's paraphrase. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Listen to verse three, some of the best advice I think in scripture Depart from here. This is God talking to Elijah. Depart from here and turn eastward. Watch this next part. And hide yourself. The God of the universe, after a gangster moment, tells Elijah, my paraphrase, go back into hiding. You were hiding before. Clearly he had to be hiding because we don't know anything about his story. Hide yourself, Elijah. I hid you 
until that conversation with Ahab, now you go hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. Okay, let's talk about, since we've defined what a season of hiding is, and I've shown you God loves to hide us. If God didn't love to hide us intentionally for seasons of time, he wouldn't have told Elijah, go hide yourself. Here's the big question, why? Why does God hide us? Let me give you a couple of things, just using Elijah's story kind of as a launch pad for this conversation. First, I think one of the reasons God hides us is to change your perspective of provision. Hustlers think it's the hustle that brings the bread. You got to get out there. You got to get your name out there. That, that'll bring the bread to hustle. Hustlers think it's the hustle that brings the bread. But in hiding, God teaches you that it isn't your hustle which brings the bread. It's him. He teaches you it's not your hustle that brings the bread, but that he brings the bread and that he is the bread. Last year is a, a, a wild example of this for me. I felt the Lord say, Preston, I don't want you preaching anywhere else but home for the whole year. Okay. All right, Lord. Now, in my line of work, there's a measure of provision that comes with that. I felt the Lord saying, Preston, I'm, I'm going to do something different. I'm, I'm going to tweak your perspective of provision. Remember, money it's only one of the things God provides. He is the provider and he loves to provide far more than money. And sometimes he has to get money out of the way so that we can value his provision even more than we value him providing pennies. Let me show you. First Kings chapter 17, verse five and verse six. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Cherith Brook east of the Jordan. Verse six, the ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening. And he drank from the brook. I just want you to imagine. So it's a drought, a drought in the desert. Imagine everybody running out of water, the fear, the anxiety, the angst. Imagine falling asleep leaving what you knew, wondering where your next meal was going to come from. One of the things God was doing in Elijah's hiding at the Cherith Brook was to change his perspective of provision. Provision always, always, always comes when you go where God says to go and you do what God says to do. God said, Elijah, go to the brook Cherith. He does. And that's where that provision had been set aside for him. The ravens brought him bread and meat and he found water in the brook. Miraculous provision is a reminder from God that you can't, but he can. Sometimes I think God backs us into a corner as it relates to provision and need just to remind us, just to to reestablish the record, to set the record straight and say, Preston, don't get it twisted. You might have been on a little bit of a hot streak, but your hot streaks come from my blessing and anointing, not from your gifting. And another way to say that, Preston, is everything you have is from me. So sometimes I'm going to mix it up where you think provision is going to come from this way, but I'm going to send you somewhere else and bring provision in from the ravens. Remember, God told him to go to the Cherith Brook. It was his obedience. He went where God told him to go. When you go where God says to go and you do what God says to do, there will always, always, always be provision there. Here's the next reason I think God has us go through seasons of hiding. To prove provision isn't the point. I think sometimes in a world filled with needs, and I, God created us with needs, I teach that. But sometimes I think 
we can have a tendency as humans to get a little bit too focused on what we want and what we need. And we value those things more than the most valuable things, which are the things of God. Look at verse 7. So remember, Elijah's at the brook Cherith. He's got water in a drought, and he's got food after leaving all of his former provision. Watch verse 7. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Now the drought's gotten so bad that he can't even get a drink out of the brook that was bringing him water. I love it when God throws these curveballs at us. I know we might not love it in the moment. For you, maybe the brook Cherith was the job you thought you'd have for 20 years. It was bringing a measure of provision and sustenance that you had not seen before. And then in COVID, the brook dried up. Maybe you wondered, God, why did you do this? I'll tell you just from my vantage point and my personal experience, oftentimes when God causes a brook to dry up, there is divine purpose in it. For instance, first big thing, God allows the brook to dry up. So we don't rely on the brook more than we rely on the book, capital B. He is the word. Jesus is the word. The word became flesh. The word is God. Sometimes we have a tendency to exalt the brook that is bringing us what we need and want more than we exalt the book, the word, our God who brought the brook to us. So sometimes he causes that job to dry up because we started to see our boss as our provider more than our God. Remember, your job is just a brook, bro. It is not a God. It's just a brook. And it's the brook God is using in this season of your life. The point of God's provision isn't the provision. It's the provider. Don't get it twisted. Yeah, the brook is great, but it's not better than the one who provided it. God changes the way he provides to help us appreciate his power and his unchangeableness. He does it on purpose. Things change. God doesn't. And the more things change, the more we appreciate that he doesn't change. Now, some of you might be a little frustrated right now with me, even more so with God going, I feel like God pulled the rug out from underneath you. Man, God just pulled the rug out from underneath me and I am ticked at God because the brook dried up. God isn't pulling the rug out from beneath you. God is pulling out a new rug to cover you. It's a blanket, not a rug, bro. Stop tripping. I'm so mad at God. He just, the brook dried up. He pulled the rug. No, 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 no. If one brook dries up, it's because he's leading you to a new one to teach you new things and to show you new sides of himself. Chill. Look, I'll show it to you. Verses eight and nine. Then the Lord said to Elijah. So remember, the brook dried up. The Lord says to Elijah, I got a spot. Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow in Zarephath to feed you. Don't you think God knew the brook was about to dry up? God knows everything about everything. He knows the end before the beginning. Don't you think he knew the brook's about to dry up? He had already prepared the widow for Elijah's arrival. You need to hear this. If you just lost your job and the brook dried up, God has already prepared another place for your arrival. You just need to obediently go where he tells you to go and do whatever he tells you to do. 
as your brother in Christ, I am begging you, I am pleading with you, please don't worship a brook. God will make it dry up. But also, when the brook does dry up, don't freak out. He leads you beside still waters, even when the place of still water dries up. He's got another brook. Elijah, I know the brook dried up. I got you. Go to Zarephath. I've been speaking to a widow there about your arrival. She's ready to receive you. Here's the next thing I want you to see about the why behind God taking us through seasons of hiding to prepare you for the moment, not just a moment, the moment. Here's what you have to remember. If, if you know scripture, you probably know what goes down in 1 Kings 18, the showdown on Mount Carmel. Bro, a showdown for all showdowns. This is gonna sound really simplistic and elementary, but it's pretty savage. Remember in life, 1 Kings 17, always precedes 1 Kings 18. Zarephath is always before Carmel. The Cherith Brook is always before a contest on Mount Carmel. Don't forget the divine order of things. We don't just get to step into some crazy holy moment like the showdown on Mount Carmel. We have to be prepared at the brook and in Zarephath. Let me say it like this. A second, one, a second of supernaturally public use requires a season of intentionally private preparation. Let me try and walk this out using one of the best shooters of all time, if not the greatest shooter in the history of the NBA so far, Steph Curry, an absolute dog. A savage totally changed the entire way that basketball is played, not just in the NBA, but at every level around the world. Steph Curry, no one was jacking up half court shots before Steph. Now you got junior hires coming across mid court, throwing up threes from long range on the logo. Why? Well, because Steph started doing it at the highest level. He had a higher shooting percentage at half court than half the guys in the league had at the free throw, uh, you know, inside the free throw line. How did he get there? I'll tell you what I think. Thousands and thousands of hours of preparation. You don't just make shots like that without spending thousands of hours putting up hundreds of thousands shots. Let me say it like this. We use Steph to teach us this principle. An expert like Steph, you, whatever your field, you apply your field. His is basketball. An expert like Steph spends thousands of hours putting up shots no one sees just to make one last second shot everyone remembers. Oh, I want to be the guy who makes the winning shot. Then you better get in the gym, whatever your gym is, whether it's the boardroom, whether it's the operating room, whether it's a, a home, you're in real estate. It doesn't matter to me what court God has you on in this season of your life. The principle is the same. You've got to put in the time of preparation so that in that moment that God asked you to step into, and I think some of us as believers, we just think, well, God can take an unprepared woman, an unprepared man, and supernaturally work through. Okay, yes, I get that. But we should never use that as an excuse to always show up completely unprepared for holy moments. This is a principle. And I, and I feel like for me personally, the Lord has made sure that I understand this principle. You got to put up thousands and thousands and thousands of shots for thousands of hours with no one watching, just so you can make one last second shot. Everybody remembers. 
It's preparation. God was preparing Elijah for the moment, one of the most famous moments of his life, one of the most famous moments in Scripture. And that word famous just means influential. What God did through Elijah on Mount Carmel is still influencing and impacting us today. But trust and believe, even though we don't pick up in Elijah's life until 1 Kings 17 verse 1, I guarantee you, God was doing things while he was hiding to prepare him for the moment where he could no longer hide once it went down. Here's the next thing that I believe God is doing when he has us in a season of hiding. He puts us there to prepare you to steward his power. It's not just to prepare you for the moment. It's to prepare you to steward his power. This is a savage cut right here. What God does in you until it's time is all about what God wants to do through you when it's time. Let that just wash over you. Let that knife just cut that flesh. Don't let the water of the word just wash. Let it cut. What God does in me until it's time is all about what God wants to do through me when it's time. Proverbs 22 verse 3 says this, the prudent sees danger and hides himself but the simple go on and suffer for it. Let's talk about this for a moment. Okay, what's dangerous? I get that this word danger in Proverbs 22 could describe a bunch of different things, but in, in the context of our conversation right now, let me tell you what I think danger is. Danger is a moment you're not prepared to steward. That's dangerous. How do you know you're not ready to steward a moment? when God says it's not time. That might hurt to hear. Listen, when God's telling you it's not yet time for something that not only you desire, but you feel you were created to accomplish, don't, don't, don't get it twisted, all right? He, he's not uh, telling you you're bad, but he is telling you, he is telling me, you're not ready. That's, that's how love talks. Don't give me something if I'm not ready to steward it. God doesn't want you just to enjoy the moment, quote unquote. He wants you to steward the moment for his glory. Big difference. I can enjoy a moment and it be over like that. But if I steward a moment supernaturally, the way God desires me to steward it, no matter what court it's on, it will always have lasting effects and will always bring more glory to God. What's dangerous to me? A moment you're not prepared to steward, a moment I'm not prepared to steward that we try and go steward. Scripture says a fool rushes into that moment and they suffer the consequences of not being ready for it. I don't care if you think you're ready. Preston, I'm ready. I know I'm ready. If God says you're not ready, you ain't ready. If God says it's not yet time, he is, he's telling us, Preston, you're not ready. No offense, bro. If I gave it to you now, it would drown you. Isn't that how love talks? You, do you want God to actually give you something you're not ready to steward for the long haul? You may have heard me say this before. His desire in regards to the promised land in your life, whatever that means to you, isn't for you to visit the land of the promise. It's for you to remain there and steward it supernaturally. Not to visit it like it's a vacation. If you move forward, when God says, stay put, two things are going to happen. Okay. I really want you to hear this because if you're the impetuous type and you think God rewards the hustle, even when he says not to move, I need you to hear these two things. First, the first thing that, that will happen when you do this, you will be exposed. 
Anytime you try and step into a moment, God says you're not ready for it, you're going to be exposed. So if that's you, if that's how you roll, you need to enjoy that first three seconds before you open your mouth in that conference room. Because once you open your mouth, if God said you weren't ready, but you in the flesh fought your way into that room, you need to enjoy the first three seconds before you open your mouth. Because once you open your mouth, there ain't going to be any anointing. Trust me, I have learned this the hard way. You, you can get in there. You can celebrate and you should celebrate sitting in that room because you're not going to be there for very long. When God says it's not time, don't try and force his hand. I remember one time, I've told this story before on the stage. When uh, Pastor Robert was out of town and Pastor Jimmy Evans was preaching and I was doing oversight and I'd do communion. And I was sitting on the stage next to Pastor Jimmy. He didn't even know this. In my mind thinking, oh, this is my moment. This is my moment. Pastor Robert has been overlooking me. Pastor Jimmy is about to see me do communion. And it's going to be so unbelievable that he's going to call Pastor Robert and tell him how memorable my communion was. I mean, this was the garbage going on in my head back then. Okay. Very unhealthy. But I was literally thinking, this is my moment. I walked up on that stage to do communion. And I, I kid you not, I'm not exaggerating. There was a spirit of crazy that I felt I experienced. A literal haze, a cloud of confusion, you could call it. And I'm, I'm talking, I'm setting up the bread and the cup. And I start having a conversation with myself. Which one goes first? Is it the bread or is it the cup? So I couldn't remember, so I just went with the blood. When all else fails, go with the blood. Well, if you've ever had communion, you know it's bread before the cup. So I go with the cup first. While I am walking people through taking the cup, I have the thought, oh, sweet mother of Mephibosheth, it's the bread first. And I just did the cup. And so we finish the cup, and I have this thought. Well, surely they knew the right order of things. So I'm just going to bless the cup again because they probably took the bread. I'm telling you, God, let me experience this. Maybe just for you. I know it was for me and I'll never forget it. That's why I tell the story because I don't ever want to forget what led to it. Here's what led to that crazy, embarrassing moment. God had told me it was not yet time that I was in a season of hiding, but my flesh saw it as an opportunity to take the public sphere out for a spin. And I was more concerned about everybody seeing me than I was about being obedient to God. And so I got totally exposed. Proverbs 25 verses six and seven this is a, a passage that's calibrated my life for the last 20 years. Don't demand an audience with the king or push for a place among the great. It's better to wait for an invitation from the king to sit at the head table than to be sent away in public dis disgrace. For those of us who, who think hustling is a godly attribute and it causes us to be disobedient, for those of us who strive when God says hide, we need to hear this passage. Press in what's going to happen every time. You pretend it's time. When I say it's not yet time, you're going to be publicly disgraced. Not because I'm trying to shame you, Preston, but because you are stepping out from underneath an anointing. Preston, if you will sit where I tell you to sit, there is oil for that place and that moment. But if you get out from underneath that oil and try and step into a place when it's not yet time, Preston, there's no oil for that moment or that place. That's why you'll be publicly disgraced. So here's the lesson. Preston, sit where I tell you to sit. And if I tell you to go into the deepest part of the cave where no one can find you, get comfortable, champ. Because trust me, for those of you who are are convincing yourself there's no place worse than the deep cave where no one can find you, I will tell you a far worse place 
to be on any stage before God says it's time. We'll always be exposed. Here's the second thing that happens. Something which should have lasted more than one season ends up lasting less than a few seconds. When we, we force our way into a seat at the king's table before God says it's time, sometimes it can have really dramatic implications. I remember one time, and you got to remember about me, I'm a note taker. Like I try and watch everything, especially growing up at Gateway. It's one of the best laboratories for learning that any young pastor could ever experience, really any young leader, because they didn't just learn pastoral lessons, I learned life lessons and leadership lessons. But I remember there was, there was one guy um, who really saw preaching on Pastor Robert's platform as this really, really big deal. And hear me, it's a big responsibility, but it's not a big deal, okay? Big responsibility, uh, kingdom responsibility, but not a big fleshly deal, all right? This guy made a really big deal, and so he started kind of jockeying, he started throwing comments out, and he had preached at some pretty big places, and he, he was a dude, and I'm not gonna lie, I mean, he'd, he'd done some things. But for some reason, he, he just made preaching in Gateway's pulpit like this really big deal. And so finally, after a while, he got a shot and he preached. And it wasn't that it was bad, but that's part of the problem. If God doesn't ask for something, God won't anoint you for it. I hope you just caught that. If God doesn't ask for something, he will not anoint you for it. So this guy, my opinion, just my vantage point, God didn't ask for him to preach. He preached, he got his 15 minutes, but you know what it cost him? The rest of his time there. He was gone in less than two years. Listen, hear my heart. Like there was a season where I thought standing on that stage was the biggest deal. If I could just stand on that stage, I'm a big deal. You know what I learned while I was waiting to stand on that stage for years and years? That the worst place to be is anywhere God does not ask you to be because there will be no oil for you in that moment or for you in that place. When you step out from under the anointing, don't plan on spending much time in the place you fought your way to stand. One of the things I kind of took away for me and some of the stuff that I learned through that whole deal was when your desire is to be seen by man, you'll be excited by opportunities on the stage, whatever your stage is. But when your desire is to be pleasing to God, you'll tremble when you stand on the stage you used to dream you'd one day stand on. So make sure you see things the right way. Don't, please don't have an orphan spirit and look at opportunities to be seen as a big deal. You know what's a big deal? When you step into the moment, any moment, God asks you to step into, there's oil for it and God gets glory because of it. Whether that's sitting across the table at a, at a cafe with one person or whether that's standing in front of all of the shareholders of a publicly traded company. Stand where he tells you to stand. Do what he tells you to do. Say what he tells you to say. Trust me, there will always be oil for the moment and for the place. Here's the next thing I think God does. Uh, his next, you know, the next why I want to give you behind seasons of hiding. It's to make sure you understand the point of power. So it's not just to prepare you for power. It's to make sure you understand the point of power. You ready for this? You ready for this? Here we go. This is beautiful right here. The widow always comes before the window. Let me walk it through. Let me walk it through and I'll give you the, the book to back it up. Before God places you in front of a window where everyone can see you, he makes sure you understand the plight of the widow Nobody else even sees. This is 1 Kings 17, 10 through 23. Before the window on Mount Carmel, 
was the widow of Zarephath. This happens for all of us. In in my cave of hiding, this is where God brought a, a young child into our family to be cared for in this season. And God helped me to understand the point of power isn't to be powerful. It's to be purposeful. Anytime God gives you, remember, God has all power. He's all powerful. Anytime God loans you some of his power, there's always a specific purpose. And the purpose always involves people. The point of power is stewarding the power in service of others unto God. It's not just to be powerful, to be known, to be famous. When God loans you the power of influence, it's to help others, to serve God by helping others. Listen, don't don't sit in the cave and dream of power. Prepare in the cave to steward power. The point of power is the people God is pursuing. The widow is always more important to God than the window where everybody can see you. You know how many widows we have in our lives? What if one of the things God is doing with you in this season of hiding is he's watching your eyes and your heart to see how many widows you notice. Oh yeah, you get on social media and you notice everybody else in your field that's being noticed through the window of influence. Okay, great. Well done you. So you see how many followers, all the people you feel like you're competing against who are actually on your same team if they're believers. You see how many followers they have. Great work. I don't think that's the point of God having you in hiding. He wants you to find the widow, not to be obsessed with the window. The window will will quite possibly come. Here's what you should know about that window. By the time it comes, you're probably not going to want it. When you are faithful, you get more excited seeing God do miraculous things with the widow and the life of the widows than you ever do seeing your window for everyone to see you get bigger. The point of power God loans to you, God temporarily allows you to steward, is the people he is presently pursuing. Here's another one. When God brings you in this season of hiding, it's to give you time to understand he is with you. First Kings 17 verse 24. Remember, uh, if, if you aren't reading along with me as we go through this, if you haven't read first Kings 17, one of the things that uh, two things happen uh, in the passages I didn't read to you. Uh, in 1 Kings 17, the widow is dying from starvation and the widow's son dies from sti- from sickness. So some, some pretty crazy stuff goes down. But God uses these moments of incredible need to powerfully move through Elijah. So when the widow was dying from starvation, God speaks to Elijah, tells him exactly what what to say, and tells the widow exactly what to do. And God says, hey, Elijah, and make sure you tell her, if, if she feeds you first, before she eats for herself or her son eats, here's what I'm gonna do. She's gonna have provision until it starts raining again. She's gonna have everything she needs. Okay, powerful moment. She fed Elijah first, she sees it come to pass. Well then, her son gets sick and he dies from the sickness. 
And, and it creates this, as you can imagine, incredibly tense moment between Elijah, the man of God, and this widow. And so she cries out for help. Elijah cries out to God. And the boy is given life again. Listen to the widow's response. Verse 24, she says to Elijah, now I know for sure. <laughs> She's like, I guess after, after the whole food thing, I, I kind of thought you might be a dude, but now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. I wonder if in part the widow isn't just saying, now I know. I wonder if she was also saying, being led by the Lord, that it was time for Elijah to know. Here's kind of my, my paraphrase. I wonder if God isn't saying, Elijah, before this next part of the movie called Your Life, you need to know. You are my man. I'm with you. And I'm, I'm going to speak through you. I, I don't think she was just saying it, that she became aware. I think she was also sending a message to Elijah. Before this next part, you need to settle it. You are that man. Because God is with this man. Here's how I know. First Kings 18 verse 15. Elijah says, I swear by the Lord Almighty in whose presence I stand that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. Okay, this phrase, in whose presence I stand. Another way to see that. He says, I know. God is with me. He uses God's name and he says, the God who is with me. And I know God is with me. Okay. I, I want to kind of uh, apply this to, to my path because you might see how it applies to your path in the way it applies and applied to my path. When I was growing up, I heard a lot of people. I grew up in the church. My grandfather was a pastor. My mom's dad was a deacon in his church for many years. And my dad was a pastor. So I grew up in the church. And for whatever reason, I, I heard a, a, a number of people when I was younger say, son, God's hand is on you. I think I kind of understand what they were trying to say. You know, I don't know if it was the best thing for me to hear so many times all those years as a young man because not understanding what they were saying led to a lot of my arrogance but i'm going to give you this line because it's filthy being around people taught me god's hand was on me because they would tell me but being all alone taught me god himself was with me sometimes God takes you away from the crowd so that he can get you all alone just to remind you and teach you. It doesn't matter how many people follow you, Preston. It doesn't matter how many people know you exist. Here's what matters. Son, I'm with you. This is why I love that Elijah says, I swear by the Lord Almighty in whose presence I stand. He says, the God who's with me. Don't gloss over that. I really do believe that one of the biggest reasons God takes us into seasons of hiding is so that we can get clear on what really matters. What matters as it relates to my life isn't if people listen to me. It's that God is with me. One of the best places to learn just how much God is with you is in a cave where no one can find you but him. There's nothing fear will ever stop you from doing when you've learned perfect love, capital P, capital L, is actually tangibly with you. There are things God's going to ask you to do in this next season of your life that may, may seem overwhelming. It's design. It's by design. It's a setup. I said it last week. I believe the reason God cursed the ground was God wanted the ground 
and the toil that comes with it to be so difficult that man would cry out to God asking for help so they could do it together. Well, God's going to ask you to do some things that might seem really overwhelming, well beyond your ability, your scope. It's by design. It's to raise the odds that you'll call on his name and the two of you will do it together. It's in the cave, oftentimes, all by ourselves, in the pain of the cuts, that we learn, oh my word. These people were saying that God's hand was on my life. That's, that's great. But it's like the little boy wanted to say back, I don't want his hand. I want his whole being. I want all of him. It's in the cave where no one can find you, where you really get a revelation. God is with you. He got you away from all those other people just so he could remind you. Even if they're not with you, I am. So here's the big question that we'll end with. When is the season of hiding over? I'll submit this answer to you. I think the season of hiding is over when everything is ready and you are ready to handle it. Preston, how, how long is, am I gonna stay in the season of hiding? I'm frustrated. It's my time. Not if God says it's not. When is this season gonna be over? I don't know, I'm not God. But I think it will be over when everything is ready and when you are ready to handle it. Two really big parts. It's a both and. I just wanna remind you, if you're in a season of hiding, some words from Jesus' own mouth. And I get he's talking about a future place, but I, I wanna use these words to help you understand this principle and these words apply to any place. God is preparing and any person for whom a place is being prepared where they are not yet finding their feet. John 14, three, Jesus says, when everything is ready, I'll come and get you. I really do believe that's a word from the Lord for a good number of you. I just sense by the Holy Spirit, the Lord saying, shh, stop striving. The way out of this cave isn't to strive. Getting out of the cave is not a striving thing, it's a timing thing. God is preparing things. I tell you, this last summer, when I felt the Lord for the first time say to me, first time in 22 years, in my line of work, the first time I heard the Lord say, now. For 22 years, it was not yet, not yet, not yet. And then all of a sudden, seemingly for me, out of nowhere. In some ways, I'd kind of given up on ever hearing now because I was just so cool in the cave being with the one who made me. <laughs> like I, I was kind of enjoying hiding to the point I didn't, didn't want to come out of hiding. Some of you just need to be reminded by the Lord. There is beauty in the caves when God takes you into them. And he will bring you out when everything is ready and when you're ready to steward everything the way he desires you to steward it. I wanna pray to wrap up our time. And I wanna pray over two different types of people. I wanna pray over those of you who are presently in a season of hiding. But I also wanna pray over those of you who are about to come out of hiding where the, the season of hiding in the cave is coming to an end. I wanna pray over both, all right? Let's pray. God, thank you for being present with us 
in the caves. Lord, I, I hope I always have dual citizenship. I want you to use me however you want to use me out there. But I never want to lose the access I was granted and have been granted to the cave where no one else can find me but you. God, I really do believe those those are the still waters. The beautiful sound of that trickling water down the walls of those extremely dark caves where the only thing we have is you. God, it's a beautiful place. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who are in the cave right now who are in the season of hiding. God, first, would you allow them to see the beauty of the cave? W would you touch their hearts and, and just help them know not to despise, not to curse a place so beautiful? God, even the scariest places are gorgeous if you are there. God, please don't allow the enemy to get my brothers and sisters so focused on the noise outside of the cave, above the surface, that they find their flesh tempting them to run out of the cave before you say it's time. God, would you put my brothers and sisters on holy lockdown? Don't let the enemy drag them out only to be exposed because it's not yet time. God, please help them see that some of your best work is done in dark caves where no one else can see what's being done by you. Lord, I pray for each one of them who finds themselves in a season of hiding, Lord, I pray that the sound they'd hear in their hearts right now wouldn't just be the trickle of, of water. I pray they would hear the trickle, trickle of oil. There is oil in the cave. God, thank you for keeping them there until it's time. May they heed the advice you gave Elijah in 1 Corinthians 17. Hide yourself. Until I say it's time, hide yourself. Don't look for notoriety. Don't look for influence. Don't look for followers. Stay faithful in the cave. And Lord, I also pray for my brothers and sisters who are about to come out of hiding. God, may they experience your tangible presence right now. For those whose hearts are racing and the question they're asking is, God, can I handle this? God, can I survive this? Holy Spirit, would you just sweep in to wherever they are right now and just bring a measure of peace that only the Prince of Peace could usher in? God, whatever happens next with them isn't going to come down to them. It's gonna come down to you. God, thank you for protecting them all these years in the cave. Lord, as they take you, take them into the boardroom, as you take them into the new job, as you take them into that new place of influence, as you take them onto the stage, God, may the oil of heaven be poured over their lives in response to their measure of faithfulness in the cave where no one was watching. God, would you bless every single one of them in new and breathtaking ways. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you so much. 
To the cave dwellers, I love you. Keep hiding. Don't stir up your flesh and run out of that cave. To those who are coming out of hiding, may God be with you. May his hand be upon you. May his oil be all over you. And whatever happens next, may he get all the glory. I promise you this, if you will stay in hiding until he says it's time, it will all be worth the wait. I love you. I'll see you next week.